So today I'm here with my wonderful, delightful new friend, Amy Zimbel. And she has some stories of her own to tell and some things to say. So I thought we should just have, make a video of a little chat that we have and just a little discussion and get her perspective on things and see how she came to, to arrive at the way that she sees things. So Amy, um, do you want to just talk a little bit about your background and, and how you came to be who you are today? Sure. Um, in a nutshell, all 52 years, <laughs> I started out in a, just a normal family. My parents um, and my brother and we church or anything like that, but I was always curious. You know, I, I read the Bible and I had lots and lots of questions about it. And I wasn't shy about asking um so dad's favorite answer was okay don't get too wrapped up in how long they lived because some of them lived 900 years and in the beginning um and that's hard to figure out and you know you might you might um have trouble with the you know jonah living in the belly of a whale and things like that but try to figure out what the moral of the story is treat it like a a book of uh, moral lessons and see if you can find the underlying meaning. So that's kind of how I've, I've treated, I guess, my whole journey, spiritual journey, um, just reading everything I can get my hands on and trying to figure out what, what makes sense, what lines up with other things and what doesn't. And after a while, you, you sort of get good at picking out, uh, what's not true and and what is, and you hone in on those. And so, yeah, so I just, I started reading everything I could get my hands on, but this didn't happen until after uh, I went in for a colonoscopy and the doctor punctured my colon. And six hours later, I woke up in ICU I, I was lucky enough to have somebody there that could um, dial numbers because at that point I couldn't um, function. I had kind of seized. I was I had gone into a seizure. They they cleared me. They let me home. I went through recovery, all that, went home. And then this happened. This started happening when I got home. I was filling up with the bile and stuff like that. So he called 911 and it went from there. I ended up in the hospital. Right before I woke up, um, I recall, uh, as I, I saw something, I saw my, my father who had died the previous year from colon cancer, which is why I was getting the screening wow. to begin with. But yeah, uh, we all decided to, to do that, to take preventive measures and it's right. still a good idea for anybody out there. I mean, this doesn't happen a lot. Um, but he did puncture my colon and I woke up in ICU. I saw dad and I saw a figure uh, being, I guess, standing beside him. And it was uh, it wasn't odd to me that I saw him, you know, with it's like there he is, you know, dad, it's dad. And but I was really curious about, you know, which you would think it would kind of you'd run and hug him. Um, but I was, I guess I wasn't thinking like that. I was just there and he was there and this figure was there. And I guess behind him was, um, was a kind of a hazy light, you know, like a lot of people say they see a light. So I, I guess, uh, it wasn't a room or a place. It was just a light behind him. It wasn't blinding me. Um, like some people say, but, um, he had the figure was, uh, I would say about a foot taller, uh, maybe a little more than a foot taller than my dad and a little bit wider. For some reason, he was he was taller than dad. But I noticed he had on this brown nondescript robe with a hood. And the hood was on. The robe was tied at the waist with like a plain old rope, a thin rope. And I was thinking, I just kept thinking, who is that? What? Is, who is that? person that and I saw dad and I was like oh it's but who is that and why is he wearing brown a brown robe if I'm 
fit, aren't they supposed to be in white with uh, with wings and all the things, you know, that you hear about? And so that was like, I, I just kept constant. And then my dad kind of, he kind of chuckled. He kind of was like, he was, he was in his forest service uniform. He was um, in the forest service when he was alive. And um, he just kind of chuckled a little bit. Um, and, and then I looked at him and he had this look on his face and you probably know the dad look that's like, uh, you know what you have to do. It was, he wasn't saying a word, nothing was said, uh, verbally, you know, but he just kind of was like, and I knew what that look meant even wherever I was, if it was having, I knew what that look meant. So immediately I go back. Um, it starts to register. Okay, if he's here and I'm here, I'm not supposed to. I'm not supposed to die yet. I'm, I'm not supposed to be dead. So immediately after that, I uh, I woke up to see the the monitor that they have with the um, doot doot, you know, the lines, and it was flat. And then it started to register waves. Um, and so that's the first thing I saw. I realized that I was in a hospital room and I, I looked down at all these tubes and the foot pump on and all that stuff and then the nurse came in right away they're they're really on top of it and I see you she came right out and was calming me and very very gently uh, you know talking to me and I said where's my dad where's my family because dad you know wasn't there <laughs> And that registered at that point, you know, so I asked her, where's my family? And then, you know, she said, well, well, they're, they're allowed to come in to by, you know, two at a time. And, um, if you're ready to see, um, you know, we can go ahead and so my mom and my brother came in and, um, they, uh, I must've looked horrible because they were both holding hands. They were together like this, looking at me like, Hey, are you okay? And it been it had been six hours. I had been in the ICU for six hours. And uh so yeah, that was my the that was one of the things that happened to me that that sort of instigated this searching, this well, spiritual searching. What was that that I saw? You know. Um I, I guess some I should questions for you. Can I can I interrupt you before you get away and I forget my questions? Sure. Um, was anybody with you when you sure. woke up and yeah. saw that there was a flat line? Was anybody in the room with you? No, huh? No, um, I was by myself. It was dark. Um, but in ICU, they have, you know, they have the window with the nurses that are watching you like every second. So each person has their own nurse. Um, oh, and she, oh, it wasn't very long before oh, she I came see. in there. Yeah, she was she was very quickly in there as soon as I opened my eyes, okay. and um, because I I didn't know where I was, I didn't know what had happened, you know. Uh, so they're there to kind of keep you at a level, you know, to keep you calm, and um, and she was really good at that. She was really good at uh, answering questions and and calming me, you know. So. Yeah, so the year prior to that was when my dad died from colon cancer. Um, when he was on hospice and I was here, I was at our house, uh, my sister-in-law, my brother, we were all here. We, Dad wanted us to come home from where we were, you know, our jobs and everything to be with him, he he knew it was getting really close. He he had that knowledge, and he showed all of those signs, you know. Um, and I could, I could get, I'll get into that in a minute about what what the signs are that I've seen, because now I've seen several people at that moment of of death, and so they they do similar things that are interesting as well. But um, I was asleep. I originally had gone to sleep on an air mattress beside him and it started to leak and I was half on half off. So I said, okay, well I'll go in my bedroom and, and sleep for a little bit. So he was in his room 
by himself on the on the hospice bed. Uh, I guess it was about three o'clock in the morning. I heard my name. I heard Amy, and it was it was like a whisper, but it it seemed like it was more than one person whispering. It's kind of like an echo, and I just shot up out of bed and immediately went down the hall, and uh, was there with him when he took his last breaths. You know, um, and again, uh, so this would have been like the very first odd odd occurrence, you know, to me, and uh. There was no one there that he could speak at that point. Um, Amy, you, you broke up a little to get bit. My attention. Amy, I wouldn't have heard it from Amy. Amy, you broke up a little bit on the last sentence. Could you tell us okay. what happened? Can you hear me? After the moment you were there with him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he he was. Uh, not able to speak at that point or to call anybody's name. Everyone else in the house was asleep. Uh, so it was, it was something that I heard and it woke me from a, a deep sleep to get my attention, to go in there and be with him. And that was important. It was odd. It was, it was, um, you know, but you, you don't think of it like right away that late. It's like later on you go, who woke me up? I wonder how I woke up, you know, and I mentioned it to my family. I said, you know, I, I heard somebody call my name. And so I went down the hall and it was like I was invisible. It was like they looked right through me. It didn't register as something unusual or otherworldly. So I thought, OK, well, maybe people just say things like that all the time, you know. And but I actually heard audible voices, so that was another thing that um, made me very curious and sent me on this journey. Now I think we're sort of programmed or trained in a way to not talk about or think about things like that when they happen, and that's exactly what happened to me. I didn't bring it up for twenty more years. Um, and, you know, um, thought about it. I was buying, I was buying books. I had tons of books that it wasn't like, um, books that I never got around to reading. You know, it was just like, I'd see something interesting and I'd get it. Um, and so eventually I was in a car wreck after that. I, I survived through the car wreck. Um, they said I shouldn't. I was very lucky to be here because the car was uh, was going about 50 miles an hour. And I ended up going down uh, one of those concrete embankments at a bridge, hitting head on. And it was, there was water up to my neck. And I just remember opening my eyes and saying, help, like, help. And I made it through that. They said I shouldn't Were have. Were you by yourself made it at that time? That. Uh, you by yourself car that I was. Did you hear the? Do I need to go back to? No, to I think part? we got Did enough of it. I just you, you hit an embankment and uh, head on. You were going about fifty yes. miles an hour, and then you were in water up mm -hmm. to your neck. Yeah. So I just remember opening my eyes long enough to say help, and. Then I remember again, just I woke up in the hospital. So you woke up in the hospital then after and that? I, they were amazed that I made it. Through. Yeah. And the medical personnel was amazed that I, you know, wasn't more severely damaged. I did end up having pins in my leg from that, uh, but I recovered and I lived. And um, so that happened. I, I made it through that. These are all just things that are that are happening that uh, kind of led me to to doing all this research and, and led me to you. I, you know, I've 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 seen a lot of uh, near death accounts. Um, I've heard a lot of stories and I've read a lot of material. And like I said, you get you get good at picking out uh, like I guess what you would call uh, the synchronicities, the things that are 
you see, it seems like they're put there for you and they help you along with your journey. You know, one thing leads to another. Um, so after my dog died, I, uh, I was needless to say, I lost my, my dad and my mom at this point, uh, when I was both of them by age 28 and then my dog and I just lost it. I said, why, you know, I wanted to know why. And it was this, uh, it's a very real question, a very sincere question. I, I de almost demanded to know why all this happened. So at that point, um, I started waking up at 420 on the dot every morning for about three weeks, getting these, um, I would call it just selective memories of various things that happened in my life. Um, sort of like pieces of a puzzle being put together for me to consider. It wasn't like anyone was talking to me. I was just remembering uh, things like when when I was six or seven years old, asking mom and dad why I picked them before we came here, you know. And they just, oh, you know, <laughs> they didn't know how to answer that. Um, but I just felt like that's the way it worked, you know. I think kids know a lot more than we do, or at some point we did know and then we forgot, maybe. Um, but I just knew that was how it worked. And so I, yeah, but they didn't really know how to answer, you know. Um, and so all these puzzle pieces were coming together. And and I remembered, um, you know, the wreck. And I remembered making it through that. And I, I wanted to find out who that brown-robed being was. So I just was like, well, I probably find that out, you know. So I Googled it and podcast, uh, Next Level Soul. Have you ever seen that before? Uh, he has, with um, Alex Ferrari? Alex Ferrari, yeah. He has a podcast uh, where he has different guests on that they're talking about their experiences. He had a, a woman named Betty Edie come on there right. and she had written a book like one of the first books ever written mm -hmm. about NDEs NDEs uh back in the 70s and um she was talking about how she sat on that information too because she didn't know what to do with with it well you know I don't who sh how sh can you hear me now and the last thing we could hear was about Betty Edie who did write yeah. One of the earliest books, along with Damon, what was his name, Damien? Uh, anyway, they were some of the the first, I think. And uh, right. So, I do remember those books too because I read them too at that time. But go ahead from there. And you, yeah, he was talking. This was Alex Ferrari on Next Level Soul, who was talking to Betty Eady. Yes. And she had. Uh, so she was. She had her NDE and did not really share that information for 20 years just like me um so i thought uh and then while she was talking she she mentioned seeing brown road beings it was the first time i had ever watched alex's show um i think it was the first nde i had ever heard about in depth and she sat on it for 20 years. So I went and got the book and read it. And I got her account of the brown robed beings that she said that had been with her um, for eternities. And she said, now, I've heard of eternity, but I've never heard of eternities. And I just knew that we had known each other for a very long time. And so there was another, okay, that's confirmation. I'm not crazy. Somebody else has seen sort of what I've seen. And then I started seeing more, you know, more accounts of NDEs, you know, and one thing points you to another thing. And um, yeah, so that was, those are the, those are the things that have happened to me. And I find that when I, when I tell people now, when I say this, uh, when I tell the story to people now, they're more receptive in general. 
I told my cousin because her, her dad just died and I wanted to tell her, you know, there's more, there's, there's more. I don't know how, like how you feel about it or what your religion is, but I've seen it. There's, you know, and she was like, Oh, absolutely. You know, she's like, show me a story about her. One of her friends, <clears throat> or actually no, it was her husband who's, who lost his mom, his, her husband's dad's wife died, her husband's um, parents. And he saw his wife uh, after she passed in church, sat down beside her in church. He said, and my dad doesn't lie. He was like, you don't know, my dad wouldn't lie about something like that or make something like that up. And she told me it was okay to if I wanted to get married again. But I don't want to get married again, you know, but she had heard from other people and people in general are talking about this kind of thing more, which um, makes me happy because um, I think we need those stories in the world. You're not going to see them on the news. Um, and when you're healed, I guess, miraculously, you don't hear about that either. You know, there's nothing, there's no way to make money off of a spontaneous healing or anything like that. Uh, what, who would fund that kind of research? There's no money in it if you can heal yourself or if it just happens without medication. Right. So, yeah, uh, lots of, lots of things I could discuss with you. I could go on and on, you know, uh, talking with you for hours about about these things but um yeah now i'm a little closer to understanding how they lived for 900 years apparently there was a time when uh, uh we were disease free and that kind of thing happened and i think that eventually we can get there again um it was really interesting when we were we talking the other to. day Do you think we want to get to there where we could live for 900 years well in today's world i think you know a lot of things would have to change for us to live peacefully and disease free for 900 years i don't think it could easily be inserted in today's world you know a lot of things would have to to change as well um yeah but uh, when you were talking the other day about um, the school that might be happening um, eventually in the the, the eco village, um, and I think it was it was a Jesus that was talking about um, how the children would be taught not to give up their telepathy and to uh, right things like that. Um, I think we we knew at some point, or we knew when we were younger and then we're just trained to forget and not concentrate on it and you know right i could easily have had things not kept happening that were uh unusual synchronistic um occurrences i could have easily just given up on thinking about it or sharing it you know but uh yeah. So anyway, now I don't feel I don't feel so bad about sharing it. So don't you think the internet has helped a lot with that? Because for sure, you know, I I don't talk to my family except maybe one or two, and I don't really have any friends that I talk to. Most of my friends are like, "Oh my God, you've gone over the deep end," but <laughs> you know, so I don't really talk to them. But I've made a lot of new friends on the internet because you can find the people yeah on the internet that might not be in your neighborhood they might be across the ocean there, can there are relate to what you're saying entire groups of people that understand are capable of of uh listening even if they don't you know believe you necessarily they can they can see the underlying message um or maybe they've had something happen to them i mean uh, and they're not all in my neighborhood. <laughs> the, right. the the groups are not all in the neighborhood. So we have to search out. We have to, you know, in this truth seeking and, and spiritual seeking, we find the people that 
get it, you know, and want to talk more about it. Want to go further with it. Um, and I see people are, are, there's a lot of bad, obviously, going on in the world. It's a lot of conf conflict and strife and, and wars never end. Um, so we know how to do that. We've been there. Um, maybe is there a different way now that we can proceed? You know, how do we get past that? Now what's next? And, I'm, and um, a lot of people have things to say about what's next. And, uh, you know, that we can prepare. We can um, We can get past the... Well, everything in politics, it's either this way or that way. There's no other way. And that's what we're given. You make the choice. It's this one or that one. So what do you do when you say, um, wasn't there anything else? Because what if I don't like the two options? You know, what if there's a different way uh, in the same religion? You know, there's no reason that um, 174 uh, religions can't find a common ground, uh, you know, and be together as people and not get hostile over it. Just consider it and move forward that way. Um, so, yeah, we've got uh, we've got some work to do before we get to a perfect um uh, perfect world but i think envisioning it is a big step forward so what do you envision what what's the next step that you see if you see what um well i still for the most part rely on <laughs> rely on what other people see i haven't seen any like um any visions of what what it's going to be what it what it could be from what i understand we have potential uh potential futures where i mean i guess the the positive extreme would be that everybody one day decides you know what we can all destroy each other we can all have our weapons and and do that um or we could just lay them all down and everybody at once decides to do that and then i mean anything i anything is possible at that point but we'd all have to be of the same mindset to do that so that's one extreme <laughs> okay and so well let me ask you some questions then about all of the things that are going on today um what do you feel about ideas about climate change as they're called or earth changes Climate change. Uh, I think that we, some of it is uh, natural. There's a natural process that happens. We've we've been through ice ages, been through uh, you know all these catastrophes, but in small doses, and it's sort of been cyclical. Uh, but there are there are charts. Uh, the nominal rate at which uh, these changes are taking place, I don't think is uh, uh, has ever happened before, um, or maybe before, maybe just before the major catastrophes that we've had in the past. The fossil fuels, you know, burning fossil fuels over and over, and destruction. We've kind of, we've kind of said, okay, well, and now everybody's looking at it like, wow. What have we done? <laughs> it's um it's getting kind of serious now. You know. Um So what, what do you think so about it in the big harder. spiritual picture? What do you think about it in the big picture of humanity and what you were talking about earlier? How do we learn to live differently? Do you think it has we a talk part about to this play? A lot. Yeah, we we talk about this a lot like what when one person thinks about what can I do, uh, you start, you know, it's really easy to give up because you say, I can't change humanity, but you can do your own part. You can uh, see the ways in which you're more than you're putting back. 
um, you can, um, there are certain things you can do in your own life. Um, obviously, you know, recycling and trying to use less, um, trying to have a, a smaller footprint. Um, it's sort of like everybody has to kind of work together on it though. Um, um, don't you think, yeah, don't you so think not, that's, not being that's treating disgusting. the symptoms and not the disease? Yeah. In other words, what's yeah, the but, disease that what's the disease that has brought us to this point? It's a very good question. Um, thinking that we have to, it's easier and better for us, and life will be happier if everything's easier. And sometimes, uh, you know, we have to give up on uh, our our using lifestyle our addiction to everything being easy and go back to ways of doing things that aren't quite so destructive even I have to ask you again you know, isn't that treating the symptom and not the disease what are people looking for what what is humanity looking for what are you looking for in life you in my my little life here um yeah i just don't want to i want to for this to be left here left behind for my children and their children and so when well, i make a minute decision, stop a minute because i'm really digging deep here i'm going to dig deep here with you and i'm going to interrupt you because what we're really about here is seeing things from different points of view so what what is the most thing that you think motivates everybody on the face of the earth Everybody? Yeah. An idea, maybe an idea of happiness or the things that they have to do to obtain happiness. Right. What they think is Everybody happiness. Everybody wants to be happy, right? Mm hmm And so if you have more and more and more, if you think it's going to bring you happiness, do you think it works? No, because they are concentrating on the material world. Um rather than and you've touched on this before and i've thought about this and read about this a lot um what's real and we call this reality i understand we're here but i think there's a i know there's a greater truth and there are i don't how many billions of dollars you have uh how many cars, how many houses you have, I don't think you can bring that to, um, I don't think you can say I've achieved the ultimate happiness because I have these things. You know, I don't think it brings happiness. That doesn't bring happiness. The security, maybe the feeling of security that they'll never, um, they'll never be without They'll always have the material things they need. Maybe that sense of security brings a level of happiness here. Well, what happens if they world? have all those cars and everything and the world falls apart? So did it exactly. in the end? <laughs> I guess what I'm asking you is, do you think this is the collective change for humanity? The lesson they have to learn that more and more and more oh, isn't sure. necessarily, you know. For sure. Uh, what's for sure. what what will bring you to that world that you envision where all the religions put down their weapons against each other and people check their guns at the door and say, hey, you know, I want to play a different way. The way we're playing is not working. So right. can you see what I'm saying? I do. I do. Um, where did I read this? Um, a good practice is, uh, and it might have been a Course in Miracles that I read this, but a good practice would be to... Uh, Whenever you see someone else, uh, see it as a reflection of yourself. Um, learn how to, well, first you have to, you have to be in love with yourself and try to see that in other people that we're the same. We're made of the same stuff. We have the same potential. We all get sad and we're all happy sometimes, you know, and we all want something better for ourselves and our families. Um, is that what you see reflected in everybody else? We all want something better.
I see that they they have ideas of how to do that. Um, look at me, Amy. Look at me, and I don't Amy. think it can what ever do you see be reflected a, back to you from me. From you, um, as far as what we envision, what you envision. I'm just saying, what do you see? Do you see me as someone who's always looking for something better? I don't see you doing that in, in the material sense, no. I think that you, uh, you're you far more into um, spiritual truth and happiness actually being that, being the truth of... Um, of what God is, you know, and there's a small line in the is Bible. Is there anything that, that can be better? I, I, I hate to keep interrupting you, but I just want to ask you these You're questions. Fine. And I don't mean to pin yeah. you to the wall here. I'm just trying to, because I'm really about ideas and understanding each other. Is there anything better than mm -hmm. a relationship with God? No, no. So what do you see reflected nope. back to you when you look at me? A piece of God, <laughs> a piece of God. And so when you look at other people, not all of them are looking for something better, right? In other words, if I am a reflection of you, what am I reflecting in you? I think that um, you and I, you and I both, not um ascribed any kind of um ultimate happiness coming from the material world and we've tried to okay i want to be closer to god i want to know who god is and i'm going to go that way and try to learn more and more about our relationship how how that goes what does god want from us what do we want from him what are we how are we supposed to be treating each other to try to translate that into this uh this reality because we're the action we're the the physical vessel we're the ones that can do on the ground you know boots on the ground uh right. action in the world and um keeping that in mind also, as that's where your ultimate happiness is, that's where you're you're going to find those answers and uh, not in not in anything here. I think anything outside of of that truth and the one line in the Bible, "God is love," should be emphasized more <laughs> than it is. Um, we get a lot of lessons from the Bible, you know, I'm not saying that that's, that it's bad in any, any way, but and everybody has the absolute right to their own religion, but God is love. Okay. That means it's nothing outside of love in his world and God can't be anything outside of love. So the more we learn how to see that and in everyone. And then everything closer we get to that idea. We lost you a little bit there again. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's like every time the wind blows, maybe it wasn't a good idea to go outside. <laughs> but I feel like every, uh, the closer we get to that, God is love. Everything is love. We're all love. People are love. Everything that you see, everything, uh, the ground that supports you, the air that you breathe. The closer that we can get to understanding that is where that idea of true happiness, true joy, unity will come from that. Um, and then so, you know, I've started to to gravitate oh, uh, toward that, away from anything um, involving s or that would uh, cause to be separate. You know, we have a lot of separation here 
Um, it's sort of set up that way. It's set up for all and um, not not to mingle. <laughs> you know, we all have our own little, but we're actually, I think we're actually meant to be um, together more, sharing more, you know, sharing uh, experiences, ideas dinner, whatever, you know, with, uh, with all of our neighbors and the people that we encounter every day right. and not, not be so isolated and private. So I'll share something. And what I will share is that my happiness is in the material world. It's the material world I look to, to bring me happiness. So every day I look around and I say, wow, <laughs> cool world cool world here. A chair that holds me up and doesn't drop me on the ground. A blue sky out my window. The trees, the, the leaves are green today as they are coming out on the tree outside my balcony. And I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm. So I just have to say that, that it's not because I look to the spiritual, it's because I look to the material. And I know both. I I, I, I agree with what you're saying. I do. Um, because like I said, the air that we breathe and the ground that we walk on, none of that was an accident. Um, it came from somewhere, you know, it wasn't a chemical reaction and it wasn't, and this is always what I go back to when I meet an atheist or um, when I'm talking with an atheist about that subject, there's no way that this could just be happenstance. So I realize it was created for me. Everything here exists for me. There's the air that fills my lungs. And you have to, I have to every day, if I'm feeling down or whatever, remember that, you know, this is all for me. Look what he's created just for me to walk on, um, breathe. There should be enough food, uh, water, resources for all of us to eat forever and ever. It was designed that way. Um, you know, and everything else is a distraction from that. Everything else is um, to turn your attention away from that. So, yeah. Yeah, obviously this world was created for us and that's the love that's the love if you want to know how do i talk to god or where is god i don't see god that's where he is and all of that um <clears throat> and we don't a lot of times people don't um understand the miracle and that there may be other things happening here that are keeping keeping uh us alive, able to sustain ourselves, then just, oh, yeah, there it is. You know, there's, um, there's my house, there's, there's the floor that I walk on, you know. So if you can expand, and so we started a couple of years ago, what is it that you're thankful for, for Thanksgiving, and make your, make your own list, your own big list. And there's so many. There's so many things you can fill that list with. Not, I mean, small things, sm things that we think are small things. Breathing, I can breathe. After I had my, um, the pins in my leg, you know, you obviously you go through a period of, oh, woe is me. That really hurts. Now I'm on the couch for six months, you know, <laughs> it's terrible. It's, it's so terrible. But, um, if that hadn't happened to me the way it did, I have so much, uh, what's the word? I'm not, I don't know if gratitude is the right word. Um, walking on two feet normally with a normal gait and your back not hurting and your ankles not getting swollen. Why was I not thanking God every day for my two feet, you know, before that happened? Now, I do that. <laughs> sometimes you have to be hit over the, sometimes they hit you over the head. 
to get you to uh, remember, you know, that's amazing that our, our bodies function all in, all of our parts work together, you know. So don't you think that's the big so, lesson yeah. that's but going on right now to... on the earth? Yes. Don't you think that's the big yeah. lesson on the earth? Is look at the world, what's happening to it today. Yeah. How thankful were you for what you had? How thankful were you for that tree, green mm -hmm. tree out the window? How thankful yeah. for you were the blue sky and the white clouds? How thankful were you that you had a roof over your head until it was destroyed by the storm? Yeah, it's hard to imagine um, not having any of that around, not having the trees around you. And, um, um, and my dad was a forester, like I said. And so we we always were in nature. We were always doing things in nature. And I felt better in nature, too. I felt like if I was out there for an hour or more, my entire uh, being changed. I was more calm when I came out. Uh, calm, serene, happy, whatever you want to call it. It just, uh, it's a grounding, you know, when you're out there in it. It brings a lot of peace. Yeah, so... When we have these conversations here, it's always a conversation between you, whoever you are sitting here, me, and the ones in heaven's side. So mm -hmm. can we take some time in here from Absolutely. those heaven's side? Absolutely. They're they're far more um, helpful than I could ever be. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're you're helpful because mm -hmm. it is through, as you said, sharing. Yeah. That we're coming to grow, right? And yes. to heal the separation. Mm -hmm. So hearing other people's point of view is so critical. And so I'm just going to, for those who, you know, don't know, I use a pendulum and this to aid me, even as I'm telepathic, because it's just a system that we've worked out. I've worked out with heaven side and they've worked out with me so that I'm not always hearing voices until I pick up the pendulum. Although I do hear them at times, especially at night. Uh, but it's just, it allows me my privacy for my 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 downtime and they know when i pick up the pendulum it's time <laughs> okay she's ready now it helps it helps them spell out words too that i couldn't otherwise get they've often given me words that i didn't know and they had to spell them out for me see, see what their opinion is on ouija boards someday okay you want to know what the opinion is Probably. on ouija board this is the request. Have you guys got something else you wanted to say before that, or where are we at? Tobias is here. And I want to say thank you, my dear, for putting yourself on the line, because this is the firing line, because we're firing up people to get a different point of view. And so for those people who are willing to be on the firing line, they are the ones that are helping to hold the line against the coming disasters that are coming. Because this is God's way of saying, hey, people, got a tough lesson for you here. <laughs> All of you together. However, if you learn the lesson, then I might spare you a little pain and suffering. And if you don't learn the lesson, then you're gonna have a lot of pain and suffering because the pain and suffering that you have is because you didn't learn the lesson. That's all there is to it. So I want to talk to you about the Ouija board. So what's wrong with the Ouija board? Is there any reason that you would ask that question? Has someone placed some fear of the Ouija board in you? Uh, so I had one in college and it was just a fun thing. It's Parker Brothers game, you know? And I didn't think there was anything nefarious about it, but my daughter <laughs> found it years later and she buried it. She said, mom, you have to bury this board and then you have to burn the, you can't do that. You might be inviting all sorts of, you know, demons and whatever. So, I, but where's my, here's an empty, uh, the empty box for my Ouija board. What happened? I buried it. You know, she was probably 14 or something. When she's, so I just thought I'd throw that out. And uh, so I can go back to her and tell got her. that idea. Where do you think she got that idea? Movies. There might have been a movie. I don't know. Let's hear what Tobias has to say about it. Well, uh, did you say a prayer over it and <laughs> erect a tombstone? 
No. No. Because you buried all those people, you see, who you could have communicated with with the Ouija board. You buried them because you were afraid that they were in heaven, you see, and they'd come and talk to you. And that would scare the heck out of you. At least your daughter was afraid they'd come and talk to you. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been upset by it, right? Yeah. She was upset by the fact that someone like me might come and talk to you. And sometimes when people play with the Ouija board or other means of communication, or they're just very telepathic, they will hear from people who are very confused. Very confused. Have you ever talked to somebody that was very confused about life, about their own life, thinking they're a victim, blaming everybody else for everything that happens in life? Yeah. And so if you talk to them, those kinds of people on the Ouija board or in any other way, just because they're dead, you might say, is it any different? Yeah. You just say, I'm sorry, I can't resonate with what you're saying. Go away. Mm -hmm. They're not demons. Yeah, They are people that are very confused. And if you are confused, then you'll think they're demons. So the problem with the Ouija board or any other means of communication is that somebody picks it up who's very confused. And most people on earth are very confused about this because they have forgotten how to be telepathic, you see. Does this make sense to you, Amy? Yes. I think so there's nothing um, inherently and... there's not nothing inherently demonic about the Ouija board. As you said, you'll just see your own reflection in the mirror. Uh -huh. Yeah, I um, I think in general, um, have you ever seen like when there's a car accident and then and people say, "Oh my goodness," but and they just look, they stare, but they keep driving. They don't stop and say, "Can I help you?" You know, we just saw a horrible one. It was awful. Um, <clears throat> it's like rubbernecking is what they call it. So I think sometimes we get caught up in, oh, magic. You know, they're there's magic. They're doing magic and somebody's speaking telepath and they don't like actually listen further to what's being said or uh, what, what might actually be going on. <laughs> you know, uh, what is this person trying to tell me? What is, what, what do I feel like when I talk to this person? They just kind of are approaching it from, oh, magic, you know, so then they get caught in whatever they say must be, it's their magical they're a magical person, so they must be telling, <laughs> you know, if they can do magic, then they know. So, anyway. Well, Tobias is still here, and I hear you, my dear. And I want to say that today I have to go away because I can't bear anymore to hear the fear in the world and so where am i going you may ask i'm going back to earth so why am i going back to earth when there's so much fear on earth because i hear that there's going to be a new way to live on earth because all the people who live on fear of ouija boards and such like will have to hear the trumpet blow and then they'll say we gotta go we gotta go we gotta go away and they will go the other way <laughs> so they'll all come to heaven and they'll leave some room for me on earth because it's kind of crowded down there and i have to hear my dear say to me i love you you see i have to hear the words that say i love you today when i'm on earth I don't want to be on earth and people say, hey, what the fuck is the matter with you today? We're going to have to shoot you so you go away because those are the people who I fear. <laughs> I'm not afraid of the Ouija board, you see. 
I'm afraid of the ones who are afraid of the Ouija board. Because they're afraid of people like Steph, you see. And they think that she is demonic. Or commun communicating with people who are demonic. And so that would be me. So that would mean I'm demonic, you see. And I just say, well, you're funny today <laughs> to think that we She's are demonic here. Then. She's right? grown since then. She's grown since then, spiritually. She, yeah, it was funny when she was 14, but she's she's grown a lot spiritually since then. <laughs> yes, and that is good. However, we're not talking about her specifically. We're talking about all those people out there that might stop by our videos and say, well, it sounds like you're talking to demons today. And I say, where did you get that idea? Was it the part where I said I love you? <laughs> that told you that it was a demon today? The other day, Steph was browsing on the internet and she heard somebody say in a group chat, well, Satan disguises himself as a being of light. And that's a trap, you see. That's the trap, the steel trap that holds them in place. And so when the waters rise, they can't swim, you see, because they're trapped. Because if I were to come to them and say, hey, come this way, they'd say, you must be Satan today because you exude so much light. So I'm going to have to hide under the waves from you because it's dark down there. And it's familiar to me because I like the dark, you see. And so when I see the Ouija board, I say to myself, well, if people can communicate on there with those who have died, it must mean that they're demons because everybody that died is a demon, you see. Now they're taken down to hell because I'm so afraid. That's where I will dwell. And therefore, everything I see is my own reflection, you see. If I see a demon in you, it's the demon in me that I see reflected through you. You see? So don't worry about the Ouija board or anything else. If you trust on the light and you don't say, oh, my God, there is light all around my father and the figure in brown. So it must be Satan. That's try to trick me by taking on the appearance of my father and look at that hooded figure. Look at that hooded figure whose face is hidden in the dark and he's wearing brown. It must be the devil that has my father in his grasp. If you interpret your reality that the light around them is the light of hell you see, then you are the one that will be taken. So that the ones that are left will be the ones that will come out of the churches and say, hey, it's bright out here today. It's really bright out here today. There's a lot of light out here today. So let's close the door to the church and go for a picnic. And maybe we'll say hi to our friends, you see, and say, hey, you look happy today. You must be a reflection of me. Because I'm happy today that I don't have to sit in that pew and stew in the heat because the heat that's coming to earth is going to repeat and repeat and repeat it's him you see because it's going to say to you him the one in the brown was not the demon the one in the brown was the one who has returned to say i love you today i love you today and you know the story, don't you, Amy? You know the one that was in the brown robe because he came and told you so, didn't he? Right? Yeah. And he came to you <clears throat> because you trusted on you know who. And you said, hey, I'd like to talk to you because I think that you might reflect back to me a lot of light. And that was true. That was true. And so you saw the light in you. 
and the light in you revealed to you what was under that hood, you see, because the light in you suddenly turned on because you dared to share your story. The light turned on in front of you and you saw the face reflected back to you, right? And now you know that sometimes the hooded figures that you see might conceal the truth of the love they feel for you. And so don't be afraid of us. Take us at our word. And if you heard us say, I hate you, then just say, hey, I don't play that way. And if we say, I love you, say, then you must be true. Because I love myself too. And if you love me, and I love me, then it must be that you see your own reflection. And I see mine, you see. And this is the trust on God energy. That God will always reflect to you what is inside your soul, you see. And in that way, you can see the inner being in the world around you. If you look at a tree and you see a beautiful creation that someone put there for you, then you will see your own inner being, a beautiful thing that somebody put there for you. And if you look at a tree and you say, I better chop that down today because I need to put in a parking lot, then you will see your inner being reflected back to you, that you are very flat in your energy. You're flattened out like the road runner, flattened out Wiley e. Coyote, because you see, you didn't trust on reality. You trusted on getting more and more and more parking lots so you could get more and more cars to park in them and you could find happiness, you see, and it hasn't worked for you, has it? So start trusting on your reflection and see that the light that is reflected back is the degree of the light in you. And if you get that Ouija board out and you see a lot of darkness, it means you don't have much light shining from within. And therefore, you might try and find someone who would help you light your can candle, you see. And then you can light other candles. And eventually, everyone will be returned to God energy and not to the shadows, you see. Because the shadows tell you you are real. When you cast the shadow, you know you're real. And those who think the shadows are the demons are those who hide behind the ones who cast the shadows. And they say, I can't walk in the light today. I can't walk in the light today. Because if I walk in the light, others might see who's hiding under that hood today. They might see that who's hiding under that hood that I'm wearing is the demon that is in me. Because the demon that is in me, you see, is the one that came to me when I looked at others and I said, you must be Satan today because you shine so bright. Must be the angel of fear because in the light I can be seen. And I don't want to be seen because I carry so much shame, you see. And so I just keep blaming others because that's the way the shame and blame game works, you see. I keep blaming others for my shame and I never take responsibility for my own life. And so I'll let you go here. Think about these things, you and all those who are listening to this. And if you fear the Ouija board, then... Take a look at it and say, hey, nothing particularly troublesome about this today. It's just a board with some letters on it and a little 
planchet. And that's all there is to it. Nothing particularly scary there. Reality is not scary, people. It's only your interpretation of it. It's only the mirage you see in it. Because when you look at the Ouija board and you say, hey, nothing scary here today, then you see reality. And when you hear a voice that says, I love you, that is reality. And if your heart says, use the Ouija board to connect with me, and it says, I love you, I'm here, then trust on the fact that your heart is shining back at you. Because your inner being, you see, is the light that catches God's sight because it shines through the night and God will say, look at that little light today. Look at that little light that's shining so bright. I wanna play with you. And the others who wanna hide in the shadows, go ahead because the shadows will not conceal you from me, you see. I still know you're there, but I don't wanna play with you in a happy way because you just say to me, go away, you're too bright, you see. You're too bright, God, so go away. And so I suggest to those of you who think that Satan comes to you to trick you as a being of light or an angel of light. As the one woman said, if you see an angel of light, you know it's Satan trying to trick you. Boy, you really are in a mess, aren't you? There's no hope. Because you are totally <laughs> trapped. So take heed in this time of need that others are trusting on you to spread the good word that the angel of light is just an angel of light and it isn't going to harm you. And it isn't going to expose your secrets to others, you see. It's just going to expose your reality to you. So you can see that maybe you need to change your ways. Maybe you need to change from the one who is so programmed to believe that the light will hurt you to come to see that the darkness will never release you until you release me. Until you say, Tobias, you're not a demon today because you have a lot of good things to say. And I love you. And then I will say, I love you too. Tobias was, um, yeah, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that people are just because it, it's a, a thing that everybody, everybody can't do. Maybe it's a fear because they, they, they're not familiar. I don't know. I don't know what that, what causes that is. Um, don't you, don't you think it's the I'm, people that tell them that they need to be afraid? Don't I you think so. that every child, like you said, is telepathic and then they're trained that they can't do that? Yeah, I mean, when you, I think, I think it says that. And doesn't it say that in the Bible that you're not supposed to talk to prophecy or, or talk to any, yeah, I think it says that in there that you're not. Um, so maybe that I was. I don't know. I don't read the those, Bible. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe the only that times was I've ever things. read the Bible are little, when little portions are pointed out to me. Then I go to heaven's yeah. side and I say, what's the real message here? And then they will yeah. tell me the original. Yeah. So so it was, it, we're pretty sure it was messed with along the way that some things were inserted or some things were taken out because it, it always seemed like that to me. Um, uh, so I like to read everything um i'm anti-censorship i guess and and then pick out my own things that i want to talk about and and ignore the stuff that doesn't make sense and i always felt I have like a question in the about the people that live 900 years i have a question about the mm -hmm. people that live 900 years and i'm sorry okay. to interrupt you i just no, sometimes no, you break up and i i jump in but I have I'm a curious question too. about that because I don't know the answer to that one. So can we ask about that one? Yeah, yeah. 
I'd like to know. What do you guys know about the this claim that people live 900 years? Very, very simple step. The Anunnaki. We're the ones who were thought to be immortal, you see. And so the idea of immortality came to the earth, vibration, as a trust on those who were superior. And everybody wanted to be the ones who were immortal, you see, because you know that's the story of the golden idol, that they would be taken up into the spaceship in the sky and they would live forever in a day because the Anunnaki cloned themselves. So they always had mm. the same body. Okay. And so there arose this myth of immortality because the kindred, which are most of the humans that existed at that time, did not understand. They had no clue what cloning was about. How could they ever understand that? Yeah. Or that you could even shift your consciousness from one body to a next, which is something that people talk about today in science fiction. But back in the day, they really could do that. And so a lot mm -hmm. of these stories are so garbled, you see. Yeah. Because of the confusion yeah. of the earliest people who just could not understand the scientific reality of the Anunnaki, who were so advanced in their technology. They just couldn't understand it. So as far as I know, on Earth below, there are no people who lived for 900 years. There are some who lived quite a while, you see, because they knew how to conserve their energy and use it in a way that would help humanity. However, the idea of living for 900 years isn't very appealing to me. And I will tell you true, that the Anunnaki were trapped in their bodies, you see, because they lost their capacity for reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And that was a trap. And so if you trust on the ability to live your life out, again and again and again in a different body. You are trusting on the ability to get a different point of view and to grow. So if you always live in the same body, in the same way, in the same spaceship in the sky, you don't really get a different point of view and you don't really grow. You're just trapped, you see. And so the fact that you are born on Earth, you grow, you begin to deteriorate like the flowers that have spent their blooms is the way that God helps you to see that you're always going to change. Everything changes. Everything changes because if it were static, you see, there would be nothing. Because if time were to stand still, all of reality would cease to be. Mm. This is the magic of reality. That it's always there. You're always here. And it's always changing. You see. Be glad. Mm. Be glad that you don't live 900 years on the earth today. Because you would be desperate. Desperate. For release from your point of view. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of death. Because all it does is take you home. And you say, thank God, I'm glad to be home today. Because I did roam far away. And I forgot that all my friends were here. And that God was here. And that everything was okay here. Until you're ready to go out the door. And explore reality some more. You see? It's just a gentle transition. From one realm to the other that God in his mercy created so that you didn't have to live 900 years in the same body until you were so sick of it you gave up and you became nothing at all because nothing was better than continuing in the same point of view so did the the Anunnaki um, destroy, were their resources 
um, depleted. They had to go find somewhere else to live. The people on Nibiru did. And so the group that left Nibiru at the end when everything was dying, they destroyed through much as people do on Earth today. Not They weren't violent like people are on Earth with each other. They were very technologically advanced, but they had forgotten a lot about the spiritual dimension. And they didn't really trust on it. So like a lot of people today, they I think they pretty much thought when a baby was born, it was spontaneously generated. So the more advanced scientifically you become, the more advanced technologically you become, you can become unbalanced in your understanding of reality. And so they destroy their own plant by overpopulation, by depleting the soil until the soil couldn't produce anymore. They threw more chemicals on it, just made it worse, poisoned the people. New diseases killed them off, etc. So the group that went into space in order to save the race and to try to find another home where they could live became known as the Anunnaki. So they were a group from Nibiru who had destroyed their planet. Another mm -hmm. group, well, there were other groups. It's, it's a long story. We tell that story in Sewn Together, yeah. our book, uh, and the sequel is is in progress. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I see um, some some more parallels. I see um, resources being depleted, <laughs> and I see people forgetting spirituality. And um, I guess that would be the flip side, the the worst case um, scenario. Um, the worst case scenario would you... be what? That we destroyed the entire planet and could no longer reincarnate on it? Is that what you mean? Yeah, as as far as um, where we can go as a civilization, like if we if we all decide to lay down the guns and we go this way and decide, okay, we need to be more sustainable in our, uh, we need to put back what we take and, and we need to stop with the fossil fuels and all that um, versus what happened to the Anunnaki. Well, as I see it, it's the best case scenario. Because what it has happened is that there's enough people today on Earth who are mature enough to understand mm -hmm. uh, things that there wasn't before at the same time as we're becoming overpopulated. So it's the best case scenario because the Earth will start again. And some mm -hmm. humans will survive, but they'll be the ones that God is protecting. And they will be the ones who seed the new humanity. So it's like wiping out all the religions, all the um weapons mm -hmm, all the people mm -hmm. who trust on hatred who are afraid of ouija boards leaving only those who trust on god because god will lead them just like he led noah to build a boat yeah. he is saying to them right now build a boat so he's working with them and they may be quiet working quietly because people are laughing at them building their boat <laughs> and saying okay now what god <laughs> just keep building honey and uh, people are laughing at me and making fun of me well they'll ignore them you know and so yeah. there are a few people building boats in order to float but the rest will be swallowed by the sea because you see they've known that they've known and they have movies about it the ones that are taken and the ones that are left behind the ones that are taken yeah. will be taken to heaven they'll be happy and the ones that are left behind are the ones that god chose to because they chose God, not because of anything other than they came back to reality, chose God. And God says, well, you're the ones that need to repopulate the earth because just what Amy was talking about. Others have been thinking about it. Others have been mm -hmm. climbing the mountain and saying, hey, from here, I can see that we got a problem. I can see that people think that if they just get more, 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 more and beg God to give them more, they're going to be happy. And it doesn't work that way. So what yeah. is the third option? And God says, well, I know. I'll just wipe everybody out and start again. They'll come to heaven. They'll be happy. It's not a punishment. It's just a lesson. So that's the third. You spoiled the book for me. You just told me what the third option was. Well, it's um, not It's not okay. described that way in the third option book. The third option is mm -hmm. about learning to think for yourself. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so all those people that are going, oh, what a disaster, what a disaster. If you can think for yourself, you'll say, yeah, you know, eternity is eternity. Yeah. I'm ready to grow. And, you know, if the world gets destroyed, I'll just ask God, where should I go? How can I help you? How can I help you, God, to help humanity? That's the question. How can I help you, God, to help humanity? Mm -hmm. Not God, how can you help me? Because it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you're in heaven or wherever you're an eternal being. You'll be where you are. You will always, always, always be where you are. You are here now. And so the question, only question you have to ask is, I'm here now, God. What next? <laughs> what should I do? What should I say? And that takes a I lot saw, of trust. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but if you're going to trust in anything, I mean, <laughs> that's probably the best thing to trust uh i saw i did see where like some millionaires and billionaires are building their bunkers now um i just saw that zuckerberg is, has built a several million dollar bunker in hawaii for that so i was wondering um uh, i wonder what they know that we don't <laughs> they've been told something uh well, god what do you say about the that people we haven't that been told by bunkers they're the ones that are afraid of Ouija boards. <laughs> okay. I how can many, see that. Yeah. How many societies have there been in groups of people that let off into the wilderness to survive the apocalypse in their little cabins with their stock of guns, etc.? Those people will still be here. They'll still be here. So you just have to trust on God to say, they don't play that way, honey. I'll show you where to be safe. I'll show you where to be safe. If you are one of the ones who said to me, God, how can I help you to help humanity? The people that are building bunkers are not saying to God, hey, how can I help you, God? They're saying, God, I don't trust you to help me. And I am paying attention to the scientists that are saying everything is going to go bluey. And so I'm going to build my bunkers because I have to hide in the dark, you see. I have to hide from reality. I can't trust on the afterlife. I can't trust that if I get swept away in the sea or an earthquake takes me, that I'll be happy. In heaven, I don't trust that. All I trust on is this little body, you see. And I have to have a place where I can hide it away. So if nature and science and ignorance is going to attack me, then I will attack back, you see. I'll say, you're not going to get me. You're not going to get me. This is very different than preparing for the coming days. It's very different. Those who say to God, how can I help you, God? I know I'll have to stay behind if I want, if you want me to, are the ones who are courageous, you see. They're the ones who say, tell me what to do, God. And God doesn't say, build a bunker and hide away. God says, build a boat. And if they laugh at you, they laugh at you. But a boat will float. A bunker won't float, you see. Right. Like burying your way into hell. And not preparing for the day when you will fly away. Because God did say, hey. I protected you in a little cocoon. I showed you where to go. I showed you how to live, you see, so that you wouldn't be carried away in the rising sea or lost to the various other catastrophes that will come to the earth because you were the one of the ones that was ready to turn into a butterfly. And therefore, the others here in heaven we're waiting, like Tobias, to go back to Earth, you see. We'll have a community where they can say, thank God, I don't have to play in the old way with all those people with their guns and their churches and their evil ways. Because evil means backwards, you see. I don't have to live with all those people with their backwards point of view. I can live in peace and harmony in the communities 
of the people who said to you, how can I open the door for you? Not how can you open the door for me? Not how can you save me? Because once you know that you're eternal being, you don't have to worry about being saved, you see. You just say, I figured it out, God, I figured it out. Now, everything is always changing, isn't it? So, how would you like me to play? How would you like me to play? And that is the only question you need to ask. Just say, I love you, God. Now, what do you want me to say and do? And God will talk to you. Was that still Tobias or was that? Who was that? Tobias. He was just saying okay. that's what God would say. Right. Okay. Yeah. And we, I think you had done a video on that as well with, um, uh, I'll just sit around and wait for God to do something for me. I'll wait for this big miracle versus. Mm -hmm. What about if you do something <laughs> and then you do something first and then wait and see what happens or you do something without expecting um, for anything back, you know, just because you like doing it, just because right. it makes you, if you just happy. do it because you like doing it. Then you know mm -hmm. that God energy is working through you. Mm -hmm. If you do it because other people are forcing you to do it or they programmed you to do it or convinced you to do it then you are doing it because you don't trust on God energy. Yeah. And I do. Two different things. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, like writing a check at church or, you know, um, I knew some people that would give the church $875 a month. Mm -hmm. Just write a check. It's kind of like not getting your hands dirty. And it's kind of like, um, and you don't know where it's going to go because you didn't take part in the actual process of what happens with it or what's done with it, who it goes to, how, how you're helping. So I think a lot of people give their, uh, I guess, give their power away by doing that, you know. There's Not nothing wrong with story. writing a check for $75 a month and giving it to the church. Nothing wrong with that at all. No, it's, it's like saying eight, 875. Is, oh, 875. Nothing wrong with it at all. Yeah. Doesn't matter if it's a million dollars. Nothing wrong with it. You just say, I give what I wish to receive. And what I wish to receive is love, you see. So I'm giving away this because I love you. I love humanity. I don't know where this money is going to go. And if you figure out that they're just taking it to build a castle, or a mansion, or a bunker, or the clergy, then you might say, hey, I think I'll send my money a different way. I think I send it a different way. The part you play is just to say, I choose. I choose. I choose to yeah. write this check, or I choose not to write it. But if they tell you that you have to write the check, or you're going to go to hell, <laughs> then you're being coerced, you see. Mm -hmm. And you're not listening to God. Because God speaks through your heart. And God says, just write this check and let it go. Because you don't need all that money. All you need is love, honey. All you need is love. So give some love away. And so you say, well, I can do that. I can write this check. I don't know if it's going to go and they're going to build a mansion with it. Or if they're going to help the poor and feed the hungry. I don't know. But I know this. That it isn't going to affect my happiness. Whether I have a new couch this month. Or can put the money into a bank where it will all be worth nothing in 20 years. Or I'll die with the most money in the bank. What good did it ever do? Because I was afraid to trust on you. I was afraid to trust on you, God. So it doesn't matter what you do. It just matters why you do it. Well, let's close for today. And uh, I want to thank you for being here, Amy, and for sharing your story and being willing to listen a little bit to my thoughts. Yeah. 
and to those from heaven's side. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for being here. All right. We love you and we'll talk to you again. Okay. You as well. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, I'm going to turn off the recorder. Was that